So I think I'll get started. It's my pleasure today to introduce Charles Keller. Um, I met Charles, actually, I guess a few years ago. He was here giving a talk in a different um, uh, symposium. And then also, again, at study section. And I was just um, very inspired by his passion around the research he does and thought it'd be great to have him come give a talk in the Cancer Center. So um, his training history is pretty long, so I had to write it out so I get it all right. So he did his um, bachelor's degree at Tulane University, after which he went and did a, an MD at Baylor College of Medicine. He did his residency in pediatrics at Baylor, um, where he also did postdoctoral work at MD Anderson, actually, so we're next door, with uh, Dr. Ali Osman, where he was studying glutathione S transferase and its role in pediatric cancers and, and different pediatric cancer populations. He then moved on to um, do a pediatric hematology oncology fellowship at the University of Utah. And while there, he performed research with Mario Capecchi. Many of you probably know who, who Mario, I should say, not Mario. Mar I'm sure many of you know who Mario is. He um, was here, actually, I think just a month ago giving a talk. And he's, of course, uh, won a Nobel Prize um, several years ago now for his development of different mouse models. And what... Um, what uh, Charles did while in his lab was really started his career in developing really unique gems, so genetically engineered mouse models, to mimic or, or model different pediatric cancers, in particular rhabdomyosarcoma. So he, he made some really great models that are in use uh, for rhabdomyosarcoma while he was there. So he started as an assistant professor in 2005. Um, to my surprise, in a basic science department, I just talked to him about this a little bit, he started in the Department of Cellular and Structural Biology. So he was at University of Texas, sorry, San Antonio. So he was still doing, um, seeing, doing clinical work, but, but wanted to really spend a lot of his time doing basic research because he's very passionate about that. So he purposely went into a, a basic science department. Um, then in 2010, he was recruited away to the Department of Pediatrics, so into a clinical department at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, and I think still was really passionate about taking the basic science research and translating that into the clinic and, and translating, doing different translational type of research that could result in novel pediatric uh, therapies, pediatric cancer therapies. And so um, as a result of all that, I think he decided, he's been very innovative and decided in 2014 to found uh, uh, the Children's Cancer Therapy Development in Institute, where he's a scientific director. Um, this is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to developing novel therapies specifically to target pediatric cancers. Uh, so again, I, I, you'll probably get this when you see his talk today. He's really passionate about this, um, moving things into the clinic for, for tumors that are really largely understudied, particularly pediatric sarcomas. He's got more than 100 publications, so he's very well published. Many of them, again, are very novel, looking at novel pathways and, and tumors that are really understudied, such as sarcomas. Um, he's had constant research support, both from the NIH as well as through um, pri the private sector and private sources. And he has continues to um, train numerous uh, students, um, technicians, and postdocs. In fact, there's a previous technician of his here today who's now in the MBT BHD program here. So he's really, um, again, very passionate, I think, about all aspects of um, training as well as taking really basic research and moving it into the clinic. So with that, welcome. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. So I have uh, the mic on. So it, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and to be speaking um, to, to this collection of basic scientists and, um, and uh, clinicians, translational clinicians. You, you have a pediatric oncology program here that really is um, sort of a leader in translating uh, basic science discoveries to phase one and phase two clinical trials, and that's under the leadership of Leah Gore. Uh, so it's humbling to be uh, here among great basic scientists and Leah's group. So I have, uh, I have some disclosures to make. So, uh, so in our nonprofit biotech, as if biotech should be nonprofit, uh, we, have, uh, we have R01 funding, NCI funding, we have foundation funding. We also have some relationships with pharma. Um, the most relevant one here is that there was an unrestricted grant uh, from Syndex Pharmaceuticals to test Intenistat with a third party uh, CRO, and so uh, so keep that in mind. And I always like to recognize the people who, um, who do the work. Uh, I'm just the cheerleader who gets to take credit, uh, but there's a really hardworking young man, um, so Naren Barthi, uh, who's trained with um, Reshma Tehea, 
uh, in uh, Singapore NUS University. Uh, he had a background in epigenetics, and he came to our lab to uh, answer the question, why does a histone deacetylase turn off the transcription of an oncogenic, oncogenic fusion protein, pax 3 foxo in the childhood muscle ca cancer rhabdomyosarcoma? Uh, I should also acknowledge, and, and I will at, at various times acknowledge other collaborators, but Matthew Sablina, uh, who's an MD, PhD student here, uh, is a very important uh, part of this project's early beginnings. And uh, of course, you know, the, there are the patients who inspire us. So, uh, so I, I tell you what, you know, childhood cancer is a, is a great success story. So 83% of childhood cancers um, can be cured at the five-year mark. Um, but that also means one in five kids uh, are not cured. And they have a challenge to stay in this world with us. Uh, and they happen to be the same diseases over and over again uh, since the early 70s. So today I'm talking to you about a childhood muscle cancer, rhabdomyosarcoma, eight syllables for, for the name of a disease, um, that uh, since 1972, if it's been metastatic for the alveolar subtype, uh, there's been no one who's lived longer than seven years. And so I have a HIPAA consent form to tell you a little bit about Shane. So Shane had metastatic alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma with metastases to the spine and the brain. His parents and I were in frequent contact uh, when he was uh, with us in this world during his path. Um, but at the end, they asked, can Shane make a contribution uh, beyond life? And so painlessly after life, uh, his tumor was donated uh, from a legacy gift, a research autopsy. And it's both his cell culture and his um, patient-derived xenografts that are fundamental to the studies being shown. And I, I mention that because you have the opportunity here um, to increase the translational relevance of every study you do in cancer by collecting material painlessly at autopsy. Um, and there's, so, so, there's no limit to the amount of tumor mass you can get. And you can be guaranteed from the perspective of a graduate student, a postdoctoral fellow, or, um, or an investigator, that what you're studying at autopsy is exactly what you should be studying. It's the disease that was resistant to every therapy that was put at it, and it most needs to be understood. So, uh, so this is what I'm going to tell you today. Um, so I'm going to say it now. I'm going to go through a longer story, and then I'm going to say it again. That um, for the childhood muscle cancer, muscle cancer alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma that's driven by a fusion of translocation-mediated fusion of PAX3 to FOXO, that intinistat, a, a class one HDAC inhibitor, but not panabinistat, uh, which is uh, more potent but has more classes, very specifically turns off HDAC3. By inhibiting enzymatically HDAC3, it um, decreases the transcription of SMARK-A4. By having less SMARK-A4 messenger RNA and less SMARK-A4 protein, then a SMARC-A4 mediated repression of MIR-27A doesn't happen. It's, so you have derepression of MIR-27A. And that MIR-27A binds intron-4, the PAX3 FOXO messenger RNA, to destabilize it. So that's the story today. Um, and uh, now we'll go through the details. So just to introduce our, um, our CCTDI, the Children's Cancer Therapy Development Institute, of which Matthew was the very first employee, um, it is a nonprofit biotech, um, and its mission is to move basic science discoveries to the start of clinical trials for kids with cancer. Now, in academics and in places where you're translationally geared, like UC Denver, that may happen very often. Um, but for childhood muscle cancer, there's not been an open clinical trial for, um, for relapsed or high-risk rhabdomyosarcoma in five and a half years. And the best therapy that, that has been determined for this extends short-term survival at six and 12 months, but not long-term survival. So you, you, know, you can sit and think about, you know, why is that the case when, uh, when there's so much that we know? And so we wanted to reimagine research um, through CCTDI, where papers and grants were still important. So we're an R01, PO1 funded institution, with, uh, also with foundation grants and industry funding. But instead of papers and grants being the end all, the deliverable was getting drugs 
uh, from basic science discovery to the start of clinical trials so the kids that needed the, the drugs to be available for their advanced disease had them available. And so we're in month 39, but in our first 33 months, we moved, um, we moved drugs into three national clinical trials from our papers in Nature Medicine and Genes and Development. Um, and that's significant because if you think overall for childhood cancer, even though there are 12 drugs FDA approved for adult cancer every year, there have only been six drugs so effective at extending and saving the life of kids with cancer to earn FDA approval since 1978. Six since 1978, uh, we've moved three drugs into phase one in 33 months. So we think we have the right pace, and now we just have to make sure those drugs were the right drugs um, and that they do, in fact, save lives and get their FDA approvals. So we started out um, in, in the most unique of all circumstances. Uh, our current facility is a 5,000-square-foot, 70-year-old paint factory, um, but fortunately, Nike remodeled it with $2.5 million to use it as an off-site creative space for product launch parties. So if there was a new Air Jordan shoe, Michael Jordan would fly in. They'd, they'd play basketball in the new shoe on, on the paint factory floor, and at night they'd have a ceremonial ritual, which I'm told is called a rave. And uh, so we're the only biosafety level 2 lab with a vivarium, uh, NIH-sanctioned vivarium, that has both a DJ booth and a bar. So, um, and we've filled this out roughly, we roughly have, um, have the facilities of an eight to 10 lab department and, um, and with the same amount of core facilities you'd find at many universities. Another unique aspect is that we have, and we're very proud of our millennial based culture. Our median age is 27. Um, and um, while well, things, we, we do have a really nice, we actually pay retirement to postdocs, if you can imagine that, right? Um, so a 401k program for postdocs uh, with a 7% employer contribution with no required matching on the part of the postdoc. Uh, but I, I think the thing that is most, um, most inspiring to the, to, the, to the people who work there is that we have families visit fairly often. Um, and, um, and that's as much motivation as you can possibly give to a researcher that they're their um, research must be accurate. It has to be done in technical quadruplicates. All experiments have to repeat out on three separate occasions, on three separate weeks. Um, and, uh, and we're moving pretty fast. In fact, we're hiring a new, a new scientist about every two and a half months. But our team is quite unusual. We have half PhD level biologists and half um, engineers. And that's very, very intentional because the target identification and understanding how a disease work is best done by a biologist. But those biologists and even NIH would say, trying to figure out whether the, the particular drug that hits that target works in, in one of one, two of three, seven of nine, or 15 out of 17 patient-derived xenografts, and whether or not the drug level being used in those xenograft models is clinically achievable. One would call that, as a biologist, incremental, but, but the engineers call it engineering, and so it's the perfect match. So we have two Intel vice presidents, uh, retired Intel vice presidents on our board. One automated Intel, the other one developed the Haswell chip that's in everybody's laptop that makes it run so fast and have such great battery life. And they're a very active, involved board, and we have people frequently coming over from Intel volunteering their time. And I'd say that, too, helps us quite a bit. Now, I told you a little bit about our track record that we took these uh, nature medicine genes and development papers. We got panabinostat into trials for DIPG through the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium um, through a 13-lab um, collaboration that we ran, and the drug antinostat has gone into both phase one and now phase 1B cohort expansion trials. Um, so let me get on to talking about rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, so it is a cancer that often occurs in muscle, not exclusively occurring in muscle, but it often occurs in muscle, and it has a muscle phenotype. It expresses the, the myOD, myogenin, you might often find in developing muscle. Uh, there are two major forms. Um, there's alveolar, uh, which um, reminded the pathologist of the appearance of the lung because you have collagen septae with small round blue cells. 
and um, twice as more common as that is embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, which reminded the uh, pathologists of the streaming um, developing myoblasts from the lateral dermatomyotome during mid-gestation of the mouse. So embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma uh, tends to be uh, difficult to survive if metastatic, and alveolar, um, it has an 8% survival at five years and a 0% survival at, um, at seven years. And yet, we know so much about the genetics, right? So there's the paradox. Uh, the patients don't have the therapies that keep them in this world, and yet we know that the PAX3-FOXO um, oncogenic fusion genes, so chromosome 2 and 13 break, PAX3 breaks in half, FOXO breaks in half, these two transcription factors then have um, reciprocal uh, fusions of PAX3 to FOXO and FOXO to PAX3. It's the DNA binding domain of PAX3 that um, binds the, tr the strong transactivational domain of FOXO that's believed to, to um, cause the alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. But embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma really is a, um, it's a potpourri. So about 20, 24 to 27% of patients will have mutations in KRAS, HRAS, or NRAS. Um, P53 loss of function is prevalent in about 50% of tumors. But, um, but even though it is a tumor with a, uh, a high mutational rate, there's about 40% of patients with embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma <clears throat> for which there is no clear and obvious driver mutation. So uh, when I was in Mario Capecchi's lab, we developed conditional mouse models of, of childhood alveolar and embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. And uh, the idea with, with that Mario and I came up with was that at 2 o'clock on a Wednesday in a teenage mouse just in the muscle of the limb, you turn on the PAX3-FOXO oncogenic fusion gene, you turn off the, the P53 tumor suppressor, and then you'd be able to watch the tumors grow, invade, spread to the lymph nodes, go to the lung, understand the natural history of the disease, but also apply drugs to reverse the disease. And um, so we succeeded in modeling the, um, both the alveolar and the embryonal forms to this purpose. Um, but it was kind of a long path. It took 11,704 mice. And um, yeah, and Mario, Mario, this was a time you know funding goes up and down, and um, and so I don't know if anyone uh, does anyone change their own mouse cages? <clears throat> okay, one person, good for you. Um, so it, so it turns out Mario said you could have as many mice as you'd like as long as you change your own mouse cages. And so I had 11 racks, and you usually think a rack holds about 70 cages, but Mario's racks held a few more. And so, uh, so we really went through a lot of mice. And uh, what we did was we used conditional mouse genetics to divide muscle development into all the phases of muscle development before birth. Let's see if I have a pointer here. Um, there's a good chance this is a pointer. <clears throat> so all the phases, okay, so I'll use the cursor. So all the phases of muscle development before birth and then, oh, you're not able to see that, are you? Okay, so I'll do some pointing. So everything to the, to the left of the dotted line are the phases of muscle development before birth. Everything to the right are the phases of muscle development after birth. And so we then took those phases before and after birth, and we divided them into early, intermediate, and late phases of muscle development before birth, and then into the early, intermediate, and late phases of muscle development after birth. So you can think of um, you can think of perhaps the MIF6 Cree as being the marker of third trimester muscle in a growing um, in a growing fetus, um, and you can think of the PAC7 Cree ER as being um, I just went down to the gym, I worked out, I popped a muscle fiber, I needed one of my muscle stem cells. Thank you, Hi there. One of my muscle stem cells to proliferate, create a new myoblast and restore the, um, the satellite cell muscle stem cell pool. And so what we came to understand through conditional mouse genetics <clears throat> is that you could trigger PAX3-FOXO on and P53 off in any phase of muscle development, in any phase of muscle development before birth, and you would give rise to the classical alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma seen in children. 
And in fact, the disease which reflected the highly metastatic version was from the third trimester fetal myoblast. But no matter, no matter what phase of muscle development you triggered Pax3 FOXO in after birth, you would never get alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. So think about that a little bit, and like, don't read too much into it. I always try to tell the moms of kids who have alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, this is just mouse studies, and it's not your fault. There wasn't anything you did during pregnancy to cause this. But in a mouse, in a highly controlled environment, you, you always have to trigger alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma before birth, and then there's a pre-programmed event that later, when the uh, mouse becomes the equivalent of a toddler or a teenager, leads to formation of the tumor, right? Now, now what I also didn't say was that if you trigger Pax3 FOXO on and P53 off in other cells after birth, you do get tumors, but they're these undifferentiated sarcomas that Victor Villalobos often studies. Now, for the embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma, it was um, a similar but also more interesting story, that any phase of muscle development before birth would give rise to the toddler form of the classical embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, but, <clears throat> but only from um, the satellite cells in the presence of a modifier after birth will you give rise to the spindle cell version of embryonal rhabdomyosarcomas sarcomas in teenagers. So isn't that weird? So cell of origin for the toddler disease is before birth, even though it occurs after birth. And the teenage version is a postnatal triggering of the mutations. So, so this is why Novartis got interested uh, in working with us, because we found out the cell of origin conveyed a memory to the tumor cell of where it came from that influenced what it looked like under the microscope to the pathologist, what its histologic diagnosis was. Now, what I didn't tell you, but what led to the Intenisat studies is we also came to understand that a cell of origin conveys a memory to the tumor cell where it came from that influences what drugs it's sensitive to. So a difference in sensitivity, for example, to FGFR4 inhibitors. Now, why would that be that a satellite cell early progenitor would have a different sensitivity than a myo late maturing myoblast derived tumor. So, okay, so this all sounds good and well, and, um, and it sounds like science is advancing, but the disease certainly isn't, and uh, the treatment of the disease certainly isn't. It, it turns out that if you have alveolar or embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma that's intermediate or high risk, you're going to undergo therapy that um, will either leave, lead to a hospitalization or an ICU stay from the treatment, and we have an acceptable 3 to 4% death rate from the treatment alone. And so this is despite um, numerous people um, receiving grants and, and very actively studying this disease. And so, so when Mario and I started to, um, to build these mouse models of childhood muscle cancer, we decided we would go back to basics. And, um, and so I'll, I'll sort of go through our thinking here, and, and, um, and it's played out to, to be relevant, very relevant to today's talk. We thought there would be a cell of origin of the disease from which the tumor started. And so this is a silhouette of a girl. This is a tumor starting in the limb. Um, so there was a cell of origin, which was a maturing myoblast. And we thought that there would be an initiating mutation. Like Pax3 FOXO, you, you're on, it's in all the cancers, it's got to be the initiating mutation. But it can be necessary, but not sufficient. And that turned out to be true, that you need a cooperating initiating mutation, so P53 loss. And so that was our back-to-back -back papers in Genes and Dev um, many years ago. Um, and then... It, it's often thought if you study cancer, there's a driver mutation um, that continues to maintain the tumor. So it's tumor maintenance. Well, you know, it was quite surprising to us in our studies to find out that Pax-Foxo, although necessary but not sufficient to start the tumor, could be turned off and the tumor kept growing just fine. But through additional conditional genetic studies, by introducing uh, modifiers of disease, like uh, RB loss, for example, we, we found out that, um, that these modifiers weren't responsible for tumor initiation. They certainly weren't necessary for 
to drive the tumors, but they did lead to increased properties of local invasion, metastasis to the lymph nodes, or metastasis to the lungs. And finally, you know, these patients don't exist in, in isolation of their natural disease. We make interventions, and those interventions are treatment with chemotherapy and radiation. And so there are a number of secondary events. And I think, uh, I think one of the interesting things about rhabdomyosarcoma is that, um, is that although it's genetically silent for alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, it, it also uh, starts out with a propensity for, um, for having increased copy number of chromosomes, whole chromosomes, something that you don't detect by uh, exome sequencing or, whole, or whole, ex, whole genome sequencing, but it's true. Um, in fact, one of the predispositions to rhabdomyosarcoma is, um, does anybody know what mosaic variegated aneuploidy is? It's such a fun disease. So mosaic variegated aneuploidy is a defect in BUB1B or BUB1BL, and it's the last step of, um, of chromosomes separating from, from one foreign cell into two daughter cells that are, that are two N each. And so the, these mitotic spindle checkpoint um, proteins like BUB1B um, play a role in that, and it turns out that if you have a defect in that, um, that you, in fact, get rhabdomyosarcoma. So, okay, so back to the clinic. So one thing that the clinicians know, and something that the families know very well, is that uh, you can go in with rhabdomyosarcoma and you can get an effective treatment, and you can go into remission. And you can have a relapse, and you can go back into remission again. You can do this cycle many times, but eventually, um, the, treat, the, drug, the drugs stop working, the radiation stops working. So, so let me show you this in a different way. So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve of retrospective data um, from, from um, a European investigator. The same data has been collected by the U.S. contingent. And it says that if you have rhabdomyosarcoma with no fusion, and that's the gray line, that's the embrinal rhabdomyosarcoma, or with the alternate fusion in alveolar called PAX7 FOXO, that you're going to have an 80 to 85% survival rate over 10 years um, for the disease. And that's not too bad. But if you have the presence of PAX3 FOXO, um, that that alone is going to lead to um, a 45 to 50% difference in survival over 10 years. Now, when, when in anyone's cancer biology have you ever found a gene that predicted a 50% decrease in survival of patients? Does anyone have an example like that? I mean, uh, BCR able, okay, maybe, but like there's, it's hard to find an example of that. So wouldn't it be lovely to find a way to turn PAX3 FOXO off and shift that Kaplan-Meier curve in survival for those patients up? So, so, we, um, so we made these genetically engineered mice where at 2 o'clock on a Wednesday in a teenage mouse or in the third trimester of pregnancy, we could turn on the PAX3 FOXO gene. And being mouse geneticists, we also turned on as a second cistron the uh, jellyfish yellow fluorescent protein. And, and I tell you, like, some of, the, some of the best findings we've ever had, all the best findings have been from postdoctoral fellows, but we have a rule in our lab that 15% of the experiments, only 15% of the experiments that they do, should be experiments they haven't asked my permission to do or things I've specifically said not to do. Now, <laughs> now Matthew Savlina used that uh, 15 and stretched it to, like, 45, but... Uh, <laughs> And we talk about that a little bit. And, and no, it's not okay to spend $7,000 on a, a, a meeting attendance. Yeah, so, uh, but no, I'm kidding. Um, so, so what we did find was that when you turn PAX3 FOXO on, um, it, it, with, in these maturing myoblasts, under the control of the native PAX3 promoter, and you observe them over time, uh, Ken Kikuchi found that they blinked that if you, if you did a time lapse on the cells that are yellow, um, they, they were yellow sometimes, um, they became bright yellow, then they divided and they suddenly didn't glow anymore. And so using a num number, of different, uh, type of, um, number of different types of studies by sorting for ploidy or sorting for PAX-FOXO levels, YFP levels, we were able to, under, uh, to uh, uncover that the PAX-FOXO was being expressed in the 4N cells, but it wasn't expressed in the 2N cells. Now, how many people work with fusion oncogenes? And, and, and how many people work with fusion oncogenes driven by constitutive promoters? 
in your systems, right? And what this says is if you use the native promoter, what, what indeed happens is that, um, that you have non-constant expression. And it turns out that non-constant expression through work that Ken did revealed that PAX3FOXO was on in G2, but not M. So isn't that interesting? It was completely off in M. So it was in 4N cells, but only in the uh, phospho-CDC2 positive cells, not in the phosphohistone H3 positive cells. And what we came to understand by uh, cell sorting and, and gene expression studies followed by validations is that it increased the, uh, the amount of the proteins responsible for cell cycle transition from G2 to M. Turns out this is also when you set up for the proteins for M to G0 transition. So what would happen is that if you had overwhelming DNA double-stranded breaks from radiation or uh, from chemotherapy, that, um, that cells that would otherwise undergo a G2 to M uh, cell cycle arrest would, um, would get a free pass. They'd transition into M with uh, phosphohistone H3 gamma H2AX positive breaks, um, but they'd have enough surviving um, BRK5 expression that they didn't die. And the same thing with mitotic catastrophe. And essentially what we came to understand is that um, this was a pattern of allowing cells to, to have a lot of damage, undergo a lot of mutations. Many of them would necrose. The patient would go in remission, but a few cells would be resistant that would be responsible for the relapse. So um, there are many different ways to, um, to demonstrate this uh, chemotherapy-related resistance of having PAX3-FOXO as a treatment-related resistance for this phenomenon called checkpoint adaptation. But uh, here shown simply are rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma cells where you either have in green the normal amount of PAX-FOXO or in red the, um, the PAX-FOXO knocked down. And you can shift the IC50 of most known chemotherapeutic agents, but also targeted therapeutic agents like imatinib by turning off PAX-FOXO. A different way to look at this uh, is to not only turn off um, PAX-FOXO and uh, show an increased sensitivity to a common chemotherapy agent uh, called vincristin uh, for um, rhabdomyosarcoma. But if you add back PAX-FOXO constitutively with a lentiviral vector, you shift the curve back. So again, PAX-3-FOXO, necessary but not sufficient to start tumors, no role whatsoever in tumor maintenance, um, but also has a role in uh, multiple recurrence and resistance to disease. So, uh, so our goal, so the patients don't have recurrence, is to turn PAX-FOXO off. And in doing so, we, um, we, we borrowed um, the developmental biology literature on muscle and muscle stem cells to understand that PAX-7 is a classically bivalent locus. It has one foot on the brakes and one foot on the gas. Um, and so it can turn on or turn off very quickly by epigenetic uh, modification. Uh, we tried a number of different agents, and we came to understand the histone deacetylase agent HTAC3 in a dose-dependent manner. As you increased HTAC3, you could decrease the PAX-FOXO messenger RNA, which in turn reduced the PAX-FOXO protein level. And this effect was primarily through knockdown of HTAC3, uh, knockdown led to decreased PAX-FOXO or HDAC2. This also works on PAX-7-FOXO. And then, of course, the experiment to do is to see if you introduce antennostat at clinically achievable levels. Um, first off, can you even knock down PAX-FOXO in tumor tissue? And the answer is yes. And then, um, then the question is, does it have additive or synergistic activity with vincristin, and that's the red line. And so it suppresses growth in the presence of the agent vincristin, as we'd expect. We wouldn't expect that, if, um, that it would have single agent activity. It has a little bit of single agent activity. That's the, the blue line, but we expect that it would have a, a role in um, abrogating chemotherapy resistance uh, to vincristin, which is the red line. So using this model, and then uh, we have nine models, um, all patient-derived xenografts, some from surgeries of relapsed patients, the majority from autopsies. Uh, we came to appreciate, uh, if looking at the red line, that in each of these cases, um, the combination of um, antinostat plus vincristin 
uh, suppresses rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma growth, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma growth, um, in each of these cases. And that was enough data for the, um, for the uh, phase 1B cohort expansion that's going on in the Children's Oncology Group clinical trial, ADVL1513. So, um, so, of course, that's not enough to publish on. And so we wanted to understand to a greater extent uh, why it was that Intinistat was turning off the pax 3 foxo messenger RNA and protein. Um, and so we simply looked at myoblast and tumor cells, observing whether or not the effect of intinistat uh, uh, was on the, um, on the PAX3 side, or PAX3 regulatory elements, or whether it was a, having an effect on uh, the FOXO regulatory elements in this PAX3 FOXO fusion. And so, uh, in fact, from myoblast and tumor cells, we could see that intinistat, but not panobinistat, regulated the um, regulated the um, expression of native PAX3, um, but not regulated the expression of FOXO. And so we're looking at now at PAX3 promoter elements and maybe cis elements that may be the cause. And so what we came to then understand, and I'm sort of telling the story forward, and we kind of learned it backwards. Um, in tinistat, but not panobinistat, can, um, can suppress the expression of SMARK-A4. And so that's at the messenger RNA level, and I'm showing you protein here as well. In the absence of SMARK-A4 protein or through, uh, through by siRNA, narking down SMARK-A4, you don't have PAX3 FOXO. Uh, if you use a common SMARK-A4 inhibitor, it's also a SMARK-A2 inhibitor, but a SMARK-A4 inhibitor, PFI3, at concentrations that do veritably have um, SMARK-A4 um, enzymatic blocking activity, uh, you increase MIR-27A. So it's this um, SMARK-A4 binding site in the three prime, three prime uh, UTR of the MIR-27 locus that leads to normally to a repression of MIR-27A, um, but it's derepressed when you turn off SMARK-A4 um, at the messenger RNA and protein level or at the activity level bringing up MIR-27A. And finally, MIR-27A is an exogenous factor, does in fact um, cause the uh, expression of Paxfoxo to go down um, and a significant change in morphology of the cells. And then to bring everything full circle, so it's uh, intinistat itself does in fact confirmator in a confir confirming kind of way um, increase the expression of MER27A, so does knockdown of HDAC3. And so the model then is that intinistat but not panobinostat is capable of suppressing the expression of SMARK-A4 through its SMARK HDAC3 inhibition, uh, that in the absence of SMARK-A4, MIR27A is derepressed. It binds to intron 4, the PAX3 FOXO messenger RNA, and destabilizes the messenger RNA for which there's no protein. So, um, so we're doing pretty good for time, I think. I meant to have some time for questions. Um, and so sort of the conclusion, and this is so sort of a more broad conclusion, set of conclusions, is that uh, you know, for a disease, resources may be scarce, but things like legacy gifts, research autopsies, uh, can significantly um, improve your ability to study a disease. Uh, particularly rare diseases, and that, um, that if you take a look back at what the driving clinical problem was, and for us it was the multiple relapses, right, and that Paxfoxo was associated with the multiple relapses. If you examine the, um, the driving biologic problem of relapse and you use, uh, use all the replicates that you can achieve what you achieve here at UC Denver every day, which is to bring basic science to the bedside for clinical trials, for patients in need. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Yes? It was very interesting what you show about the fusion with the FOXO1. I only know FOXO1 being a regulator of metabolic homeostasis. Yes. And I was wondering if you, if there could be any metabolic regulation of, um, 
of the different phenotypes, you know, from the beginning as a, um, in the fetal state to the toddler to the resistance. Right. Comment on that. So, so that's what's interesting about rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. Um, so it's, it mimics fetal muscle and uh, the metabolism of fetal muscle, the myosin heavy chains and, and the white chains are, are expressed are different. Um, so no one's, ever, um, no one's ever said, like with muscle, uh, is it type 1 fast or, or type 2 fibers? Um, no one's ever phenotyped that, and it's a study worth doing. Um, FOXO, uh, you know, we did study FOXO. Um, in the mouse, you can do things like turn FOXO on, and you can either leave the remaining copy of FOXO, or you can knock out one or both copies of it. Um, there was no synergy in tumor formation by knocking out the, the FOXOs. So, um, so no doubt PAX-FOXO, um, no doubt PAX-FOXO, um, has some activities of FOXO, of the fusion protein, but FOXO specifically, we haven't found a role for it um, itself specifically. Yes? So I was wondering, when you did the combination therapy with the that, what was it called? Yes. So do you do different time points in those animal models so we can see, you can establish the model Right. So, so the question was about the timing of of tumor implantation versus treatment, and whether our endpoints were primary tumor growth or looking at metastases. And I will say this is part of a seventeen patient drive xenograph study. And so, um, so what we were, what we did was we implanted the tumors, and then two days later started therapy. So we allowed the tumors to establish, but not to grow significantly. It was the simplest experimental design that we had money for. There was roughly, roughly, and that still cost five hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars to do. So, um, but we would be interested in in metastasis endpoints, and we've collected those lungs. Um, for the most part, because we were looking at primary tumor growth um, and, and we started therapy early enough, uh, we didn't see any significant difference in lung mets. Had we designed the experiment differently with that as the primary endpoint, we might have. So. Yes? Right. Say that one more time, so repeat the question. So you inhibit the HDAT, right? Right. 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 So I was just curious whether the triangle might be not Well, right. So we do think a little bit about NERD complexes and NCOR complexes and the type of complexes that would have HDAX embedded in them. Um, you know, it's a much more complicated story, and so Ben Garcia has been helping us out a little bit. You know, we've we've done um, we've done a, a, a full full set of um, what's different between antinostat and panembinostat um, histone modifications, and so it's restricted to this one very specific change, which which frankly makes no sense. Um, so it's a, an increase in H three K twenty seven mark um, that. Intinistat, um, intinistat causes increase in the trimethyl mark, and uh, panembinostat doesn't. Um, and so we've been looking at polycomb, and um, it, it, it's um, it, it's a well, it 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 is either a complicated story or one we don't understand yet. So, yeah, yes. Any cell that's not in 
it's such a great... Right. I, I think that's a really important question. So vincristin has a, a 15 minute C max and then it goes down to almost basal levels. Um, so when vincristin is given, it, it's hopefully hitting whatever cells are, are in the G2 or M phase. We think the G2 to M transition time is pretty short. The, the uh, All, all I can do to, to defend the approach is show, say that it worked in mice and we got lucky. Um, but if we could just synchronize our patient's tumors so that they're all in the same phase of the cell cycle, find a biomarker for it, uh, this would be a much more effective therapy. Yeah, it, it's, a real, it's a real concern. And the question is, yeah, like what happens? How do people... Yeah, so, so I, will, I will say in the studies done here and then in genetic knockdowns, so we've, we've had a couple papers on this, um, that, that whether it was radiation, cyclophosphamide, um, vincristin, if, if you simply have antinostat on board, which has this super long two, it's like a one-week half-life, and then you give those agents or radiation, that, that you do prevent cells from, from surviving. They undergo apoptosis. They don't become polyploid. Uh, they don't go on to have um, lots of gamma H2AX um, positive uh, cells um, in M and yet be apoptotic resistant. So the, the, the beauty is antinostat has a super long half-life. The downside is antinostat is particularly harsh on, on platelets. And so if you were prone to having your platelets eliminated by, by any drug uh, and you had that complication by treatment of antinostat, the only thing that could prevent you from bleeding to death would be dialysis. It sounds like a very non-satisfactory answer, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, yeah, so vincristin, you know, it's amazing. Like, we always think of vincristin toxicity with respect to adults who don't want to have anything to do with it because their intestines stop, stop moving and um, they are unable to walk upstairs. But kids tolerate vincristin incredibly well. Um, and it, there, it turns out there's epigenetic regulation of drug metabolism for vincristin, and kids do fine with repeated doses of vincristin. Yeah. Hi, Dan. What regulates this? Oh, yeah. I have this some of the proteins that are in the network for this, like the TNI and such, and that are also known to be important in muscle development, do the same thing. They also are periodic, they come up in G2. And so I know that in muscle development, they have a feedback loop and they regulate each other. So I'm wondering if those proteins Right. So, um, and this goes back to an earlier question. So, um, so FOXO itself um, is in neurons is regulated at G two phase of the cell cycle by acetylation um, that leads to its degradation, ubiquitin mediated degradation um, in M. Well, well, it's a push and a pull. Um, the PAX three is regulating its expression of going on. And, and more likely than not, the um, acetylation of the FOXO side makes it go away after G2. It's really, really not there in M. And it really, really is there at G2. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your attention.